Upon this battle depends the survival of Christian civilization. But what does it mean for the language to be pure? Or when people say they want English to be pure, what are they talking about? Is Shakespeare pure? I mean, uh, in fact, uh, every stage of history, language is that there is no such thing as a language. There are lots of things that are speaking that different people have. They will still say, this is the language of the Christian people. Welcome to episode number four of the Everything Keys. I am your host, John. I'm joined again today by Nathan. Hi, Nathan. Are you there, Nathan? Yes. Can you hear me? I can now. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Good. Okay. <laughs> maybe maybe we had a little glitch. So we're continuing. Today in Dialave's book, uh, Hebraic Tongue Restored, on chapter number two, 73 pages into it, and we get to chapter two. Chapter two is starting in a bit on a closer examination of the signs, which I think was one thing that might have gotten misinterpreted. Um, in the last episode, as far as what he was um, considering parts of speech, when because he's I don't know if it's him or if it's actually the woman who translated this, um, as far as things and how they come through. But when he stated the parts of speech, he was each time. I think he was giving either his or the translators uh, um, best, let's say, um, I don't know, uh, what he thought was the best equivalent of the Hebrew word for the parts of speech that he was articulating. So he said that the parts of speech are um, the noun, the verb, the sign, the relationship. And when he said sign, um, he gave the the Hebrew word out, which would just be uh, a, u, t, which it's usually represented as at. But by him doing that, I think it it actually derailed us slightly in that I at least I thought he was speaking more, more of that particular word because it is translated as sign uh, quite often. Uh, however, it, it, it has other uses, which we we will actually have to look at in the course of uh, it's either this chapter or the next chapter. Um, but I did want to clarify that real quick is that I don't think he was actually pointing to that word as um, his parts of speech. But he was saying the sign when he said the sign, what he meant, I believe he's just calling the characters what I would call glyphs signs and and that's what i found out uh in this further reading because he he repeatedly refers to what some would call hebrew letters or characters what i call glyphs he calls signs um uh-huh. yeah and i i didn't catch that until until this part of the reading so um I'm going to say in general, whenever he's using the word sign, he's typically, I I guess, just generally just referring to glyphs. Um, So I I think that should help a bit. Um, I don't know if that throws anything uh, that you'd prepared off or not, but um, it's good to know. 
But but like I said, uh, at at some point he does have a, a bit of a section where he does talk about, about the actual word for sign at. Uh, I've looked into that quite a bit in the meantime, and I found some interesting things out about it. So we'll, we'll be able to talk about that uh, too. And uh, so in chapter two, signs considered as characters. Well, this is certainly one of the reasons why I, I chose this book as just a, a, a basis uh, as a talking point is because, of course, of course he does treat um, these, what some people would call letters, which are not, not, he treats them as signs or glyphs or ideograms. Um, and so he, he begins to go a little bit further in, in, uh, in trying to dissect his, uh, his view of what the meanings of these are. I don't know that we'll be able to spend a whole lot of time, uh, dissecting it, his definitions because the, the, they're so subjective at this point in time. I, you know, I could object strongly to a, a lot of his interpretations of them, but we probably won't know for sure, though I will to a degree, until we get to where he has to prove these things out. Um, what So what was it in in at least this section of chapter two that, that stuck out to you? Um, I think the, the pressing point of this section was how he tears apart the formative texts of the later languages after Hebrew mm. and the people that studied Chaldaic and Samaritan Hebrew and Egyptian and Latin and how they were wrong. And he'll plainly state this a few times, how oh. they were wrong because they were ignorant of the language. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we can dissect things while being ignorant of them, but um, he does have a pretty good point. Um, uh -huh. especially when he talks about, uh, Prisian mm -hmm. and this is, uh, can't be more than 10 pages into the, the actual text I'm looking for mm -hmm. the bullet point where he speaks of Prisian and mm -hmm. then Zora. But, um, just, mm -hmm. just that in the first few pages, um, he spends a lot of time telling you why the people that came before him were wrong. So we'll see if, uh, We'll see if I believe that statement or not. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh. Well, I do like the fact that that immediately uh, he brings up just a real common sense point. At least I've thought it was a common sense point since I even got the the light bulb that came on about a lot of this. Is uh, he says I ask in all good faith how the alphabet of the Hebrews could have lacked the proper characters to designate the vowels. Since it's known that the Egyptians, here we go again, right, who were their masters in all the <laughs> sciences, and there, there's just no proof of that. I, I don't get where how he starts out so plainly and sensibly and then goes to something that I don't even know how much secular proof there, there is of these things. Not, not much really concrete. And of course, you can't get this from the Bible because the, 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 the amount of material concerning when they were in Mitzram, it's just so minuscule. We've got them making bricks and them taking away their straw, but now we've got the Egyptians who are their master in all the sciences, possessed these characters and made use of them according to the report of Demetrius and, and Philarius to note their music and solemnize it. Well, anyways, I, I did like the fact that immediately he points out one of the most kind of, in my opinion, the most common sense thing. Are you kidding me? Oh, they didn't have vowels, really. Does anybody realize that that really the whole backbone of any language are the vowels? You can't vocalize without vowels. Sure, there are some languages that are pretty 
interesting out there. I'll, I'll hand you that. But they still have to have a certain amount of vocalization to them. Even the ones that have uh, some real interesting run-on consonantal vocalizations they make, the, the language really is nothing without the vowel. It's, it rounds out the it rounds out every possible other thing you end up doing with your mouth. Um, so I'm I'm really surprised that more people don't say that. You know that that the reaction. I remember the first first day I was ever introduced to Hebrew. And I didn't really know anything about it, and I'm, I'm pretty sure it was actually in a uh, um, a class in seminary. Um, it wasn't on language per se, but it, we did do a little bit on the Hebrew language and finding out they had no vowels. And, um, I couldn't even wrap my head around that. What are you talking about? They had no vowels. Uh, and funny that all these years later, I came back to that and, and asked the same question. What are you talking about? How can they not have vowels? Um, and and here's the real twist to it. He begins with such a common sense statement. And I, I love it. And then within a page, he goes on to present um, not only the, the five common vowel sounds that we see in at least uh, all Western languages, um, he, he all also kind of um, diphthongs it a little bit by by doubling up on the ooh and he ends up throwing in the ha also which that is just so ironic because that's I think that's far more uh, a Masoretic trait that he's incorporating into this um, so Anybody who understands Masoretic even a little bit um, is not going to be surprised to see him just kind of fall in suit where he represents uh, the A ah, or the so-called Aleph as a soft vowel represented by A, the E eh, or the so-called He, a stronger vowel represented by, by the E or H, then the Ha or so-called Ket or Chet, very very strong pectoral vowel represented by E, H, or CH. Now, that is entirely Masoretic. That comes from their dictates, just as much as pronouncing uh, the, the glyph be as v, or the glyph pe as f. Uh -huh. um, and, and so it's, it's so interesting how bait and switchy he is. I'm not saying he... I'm not saying he's really doing that on purpose. Um, I found that John Thompson, who was uh, the leader of a movement that was really similar to this, and I don't know if they had much uh, influence on one another or not, he did something very similar. He was, he was very much against the, uh, the inorganic qualities of, uh, of the Masoretic Nicodote, but when he took them all away, he really ended up, it, it, it was almost as if he was presenting all these things like they were still there, but just invisible. And he does the same That's, thing with the ooh that they do. So it, it's nothing new. That's, that's what's really funny about it. You can, you can spot these. Um, there's a, a famous video that, uh, and this is a musical reference, a famous video that a man with a cello uh, posted where he is attempting to explain a perfect triplet and he plays um, two quarter notes and a dotted quarter note instead um, to explain the timing. So he's, he's telling you how to do it properly, but then he plays it in the exact way that you should not. All of these guys are saying you don't need this, but then they're doing exactly what they warn you against. So in essence, the video is pointless if you didn't know. Yeah, no, I'm I'm really not sure 
I'm really not sure what that, that comes from. I mean, obviously, in the case of a of a guy like Diallave, it's it's obviously not coming from um, stupidity or you know incompetence. I I wouldn't think. Um, you know, I don't really even know what the mindset was concerning um, how many people in the West really understood. Hebrew as the Masoretics uh, had presented it. We're talking about, and um, if you know this off the top of my head, uh, or your top of your head, you'll have to 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 say so. If not, I'm actually going back real quick to double check uh, the date of the the publication. Um, so this was actually publicized by Putnam and Sons in 1921. So it, it actually Thompson would have had an effect on him by 1921 um masoretic had already been uh once again standardized in the uh, biblia hebraica stucartensia um so there there really was no more uh, uh various uh masoretic interpretations floating around because uh, up until then uh, there there was no standard there was no standardization of the standardization that they said happened from the uh, seventh to tenth century. That's the so point. So this, this is mean, definitely just, after that. Yeah, the whole point of the standardization is to make you think that uh, that it's all one thing, and there is no standardization. There never has been. Yeah, there, there's not, and um, the Encyclopedia Judaica of, of all sources admits that. Now, they don't admit it outright, but they, they do admit the fact that there was constant squabbling amongst um, Hebrew scholars, rabbinic Hebrew scholars up to that point. So if there are, then obviously there isn't a standard. You can't, you can't argue if there's a standard. Um, you know, if uh, there's a lot of Christian denominations out there who hold to King James onlyism. And if they all really believed what they say, then they, they wouldn't argue amongst one another. And that's all they do. So uh, I've got a problem with that. That was a perfect translation. You guys need to stop arguing because obviously it says the same thing in both of your Bibles. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. So he spends uh, he spends over a page that uh, I don't I don't really want to I don't want to read read that or anything and I'm, I'm sure you're going to recall what he's saying because you mentioned it and he he shows it the first time um i'm gonna basically skip his his ideas on the the ah uh, or aleph and melech and melech and all that um when he gets to breaking down the word because this is a big thing that not a lot of people have heard this that's the first time i've heard this theory in this book and it definitely deserves the light of day. Uh, okay, so the Masora. It, the Masora is sort of like their word for um, the entirety of the system of applying uh, the, these, these Nikudot to the character and thus producing what they say were the tra tra traditional vocalizations. <laughs> Um, there, there's various, uh, speculation on why the Masoretes were called what they were. And because of all of the, the play with phonetics that can be done, that has been done, um, you look at it, for instance, their, uh, the names that they have for their, their punctuation or Nikud, uh, they vary in spelling depending on who you ask at what time and where. Now, the same thing happens with Masoretes and Masora. And where did it come from? Was it originally uh, from the root Mash? Was it from Mas? Um, was it Masura with an U R? And the feminine eh at the end. What was it? There, there's a lot of speculation. 
mm-hmm. that what he what he speculates here is what I find so interesting because I'm willing to believe that this is one of the most accurate uh, um, theories that there is. And his theory is that it actually came from uh, Asher. So the the country and the people that's usually translated as Assyria in the Bible, uh, that comes from one of the patriarchs, uh, one of the uh, descendants of, of Shem. M, one of Noah's three sons, his name was Asher. And so that then became translated. I can't even call it transliterated. Um, but it was transliterated if you believe in the Nakud, because depending on where a little dot is over the glyph that they call Shin or Sin, it changes it from a sh sound to an S sound. So that's how they justify turning Asher into Assyria. I don't know how they justify turning the U into an E, but, uh, or, or, uh, putting the A at the end, but, uh, that's actually very, um, Aramaic to apply A and the E sound at the end. It's very Aramaic. It's strange how that's also very, very Greek but I'm going to rabbit trail if I keep going with that. Okay. So what he what, what he then theorizes is that if Asher was the root and um, if there was more of an influence of Aramae or Aramaic on this and you applied uh, the, the prefix M, which would give you basically uh, a from uh, it's oftentimes used as from when it's applied to the front of the word. You have ma'asherit, ma'asherit, or ma'asherit, mazerit. So he gets mazerit and masera, masera, ma'asher, from asher. Now, what what is interesting about that is is this, um, he, even con. Contrary to his uh, his beliefs and his theories about the time of Ezra, when um, the Judahites came back from Babel, um, he believes that Ezra somehow re-standardized, reconnoitered the language, which that there's no there's there's zero biblical evidence of that. And again, again I believe that uh, he's getting that from rabbinic sources. It's, it's not biblical. However, what's so interesting is the fact that what is biblical is, is the fact that Asher or Assyria had moved in a, a lot of various peoples into the territories that they had, had drained of Israelites. Now, that seemed to be a real common military practice throughout. Um, well, let's say at least throughout the 1500 plus years that we have recorded in the Old and New Testament, because the New Testament recorded time period is very short. Um, that seemed extremely common when one nation would, uh, would take over another nation. They would carry them off to a different place and they would move a, one or more people, usually a number of different people in. Um, And I have to assume that what that does is it keeps everybody, for one thing, from getting together and rising up against the nation who is now their overlords. I mean, it's working today. This is precisely what the people who have power over us are continuing to do to this day. Um, And and so it, it seems like it's effective and that that's how they've been doing it. So. They, they move in uh, like a half dozen different pe- people are named. And um, those people, uh, they do speak in g- general Aramee or Aramaic. And it's quite possible because uh, Asher was a far stronger and more predominant na- nation uh, than Aram was. And they were far more unified than Aram. 
and they actually occupied a heck of a lot more territory than Aram, that it is very possible that it became known, at least amongst the inhabitants, that they brought to that land as the language of Asher. And thinking that, because here's what happened. When they came in, um, according to the Bible, they were being killed very quickly. There was a lot of people who were getting killed by, by a number of large wild animals. Uh, that were literally coming into their cities and their villages and killing people. And this was happening in an inordinate amount of of numbers of people getting killed. And uh, the king couldn't have that. He didn't know what was going on. And, And they advised him that it was likely that it was because they were not keeping uh, the laws of the God of that land. So they advised him you should bring in a priest of this God. He can teach them the things that they need to do so that he's not upset with them. And what they ended up doing was they ended up blending the the, the religion that was given to the Israelites by Yahweh with uh, uh, the various religious beliefs they had. It became a, a, a mishmash. And this is precisely what we're being shown in Ezra when they return from Babel. Uh, the people, and they have that religion now because they approach them and they want to build the t- temple with them because they say, well, your God is our God and so on and so forth, which it wasn't. It was actually a, a different hybrid uh, sort of belief and practice. And all of the fingerprints are on all of the the rabbinic texts and and so on and so forth to really back up his theory that this came more from from those people who had been transported into the land from Asher and basically became identified with that language and with that culture. So to think that Masorah or Masorite came from Ma-Asher, Ma-Asheri or Ma-Asherite is actually not even, not only is it not out of the question, it's it's probably closer to the truth than any theory that I've heard so far. So I definitely thought that 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 deserved a few minutes just on its own. Looking over that, um, I had wondered at the significance of adding that M, but I like the way that, that he states it in the book. He says, writing in the Assyrian style versus Mm -hmm. the first signifier Assyrian writing. So it's the Mm -hmm. difference between playing a song and then karaoke version. Mm -hmm. That's the way it comes off. Yeah. And he says local, he uses that term. I mean, of all the, of all the words he or the translator could have used adding the formative Mm -hmm. and local sign. Mhm. Mhm. Yeah. That I find that so odd that um what a a contradiction in terms uh he is he, he he teaches with confidence something something in in one direction concerning Ezra earlier in chapter 1. And then his assertion concerning the origin of the word Masary uh, completely contradicts that as far as I'm concerned. Uh, um, But we'll see. I don't know. I don't know if he's going to be able to successfully marry those two ideas together as we go or not. I'm not overly concerned about whether he does or not, because yeah, at this point in time, that's still speculation. I'm just saying that from my point of view what he believes concerning the origins of the name Masoret is actually that it it's more harmonious with the Bible than, than anything I've ever heard. I think that's, this is one of those little jewels um, mm-hmm. that I found in, in this book as we go. Um, okay. So I, did, did you have anything else you wanted to add about that? I, I worry that if I spend too much time on that, we won't talk as, as much about language um i think that when i when i read this page 
uh, 76 in the book for anyone listening. Um, when I read this page, I spent more time on the bullet point at the bottom than I did oh, yeah. on the page. I mean, I, I seemed to grasp the page. And when I moved on, this bullet point is extensive. And uh, it's one of the times that, it is. as I said, I, I was going to get lost if I bothered to look into it. And I did. Um, mm-hmm. took you know what? All day. <clears throat> yeah. And I, I don't think it would actually hurt. Um, you know, we're, we're not pressed for time. We don't have to take commercial breaks. Nobody's breathing down our neck. Um, mm-hmm. What he's saying here, and, and, and I'll just dive into it. He says at that bullet point, and this concerns the, the, the point that, that he made that I was just talking about. Uh, he says, no one is ignorant of the famous disputes which were raised among the savants of the last centuries concerning the origin of vowel points. These points had always been considered as contemporaries of the Hebraic characters and belonging to the s- same inventors. When suddenly, about the middle of the 16th century, Elijah Levita attacked their antiquity and attributed the invention to the rabbis of the school of Tiberius, who flourished about the 5th century of our era. The entire synagogue rose in rebellion against him and regarded him as a blasphemer. His system would have remained buried in obscurity if Louis Capel, pastor of the Protestant church at at Salmer, after having passed 36 years of his life noting down the different readings of the Hebraic text, disheartened and being unable to understand it, had not changed his idea concerning these same points, which had caused him so much trouble and had not taken to heart the opinion of Elijah Levita. Buxdorf, who had just made a grammar opposed to both Elijah Levita and Capel, and started a war in which all the Hebrew scholars have taken part during the last two centuries, never asked asking themselves in their disputes for or against the points, what was the real point of question? Now this is the real point. Elijah Levita did not understand Hebrew, or if he did understand it, he was very glad to profit by an equivocal word of that tongue to start the war which drew attention to him. The word Asheri signifies in Hebrew, as in Chaldaic, Assyrian, that which belongs to Assyria. Its root, shar or shur, indicates all that which tends to rule, to be lifted up, all that which emanates from the, an original principle of force, of grandeur, and of eclat. The alphabet of which Ezra has made use in transcribing the Sefer was called the Ketiba Asherit or Assyrian writing or in a figurative sense sovereign primordial original writing the addition of the sign M or Mem for anybody who's more familiar with the Jewish form having reference to the intensive verbal form only gives more force to the expression Ketiba Asherit it signifies, therefore, writing in the manner of the Assyrian or writing emanated from the sovereign radiant principle. This is the origin of the first Mashura, the real Mashura, to which both the Hebraic characters and vowel points which accompany them must be related. But the word Asur, with without the shin, it's actually with the... Uh, so-called Samic or S, signifies all that which is bound, obliged, and subjected to rules. Uh, Aserit, a college, a convention, a thing which receives or which gives certain laws in certain circumstances. This is the origin of the second Masora. This later does not invent the vowel points, but it fixes the manner of using them. It treats of everything which pertains to the rules that regulate the orthography as well as the reading of the Sefer. These Masoretes enter, as I have said, into the minutest details of the division of the chapters and the number of verses, words, and letters which compose them. They know for 
for example, that in the first book, the Sefer called Bereshit, the Peshiot, what is he? Sorry, I can't read that. Parshiot, or great sections, are 12 in number. Those named Sederim, or orders, 43 in number, that there are all in one th- 1,534 verses, 20,713 words, 78,100 letters, and finally that in the middle of this book is, <laughs> it is at chapter 2740 at the center of these words, and he gives, and this is so small, I'm sorry, it's hard to read, uh, Uol Terabak uh, Tahia, and by the sword, no, that would have to be no, that's right. Okay. Uh, extermination, thou shalt live. All right. So I probably went, well, not a paragraph further, because what was important actually was that he brings up those other, and, and actually this isn't all um, of the possible, what, he, what he's highlighting is the possible phonetic variations that have mm-hmm. led to Masri. Uh, he, he does highlight, first off, the fact that it, it could likely have stemmed from the Asheri, which, um, by the way, for anybody who pays super close attention to the uh, so-called Hebrew text of the Bible, you'll notice that Asheri literally, I don't think, ever appears. It's always Asher. Now, yeah, it is common um, that if you're going to speak of a people, you would put that e at the end, like uh, Judah. It would be U-D or U-Dim. Um, But a lot of nations, you're going to see them usually as just the name of the patriarch. Uh, Mitzrim, Asher, and so on. Just, just kind of an interesting note there. Yeah. It, what's so weird is when you see these things in contemporary uh, lexicons and concordances, they'll use terms like uh, the Asheri or, or Yudi or um, Yisraeli and, and things like that, or uh, 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 Arami, whatever, ad nauseum. But when you see them in the text, they're are not as often referred to in that way. They are really, really commonly referred to by the name of their patriarch. That happens to be more of a latter rabbinic habit, um, t- to be a little bit more free with the text and to apply uh, the eat or the eat uh, uh, instead of calling them purely by the name of their patriarch. That, again, might actually be another sign of the mixing of two languages, because that would be more common in Aramaic or Aramaic. And this, as for the mixing, I mean, I like that he ties all that he said before together, and never mind that this bullet point was an entire page unto itself, <clears throat> split under three. Yeah. But... Um, the difference between um, bound, obliged, and subject to rules is completely different with the second Masora. And, yeah. and as to his point where, and, and we did kind of skip over the vowel part, but at the tail end of the vowel part, um, he mentions in quite a negative way the locking down of vowels taking all of the possibility out of any single word. And this goes right back to the core of the lie, the core of the change. Mm-hmm. When you lock it down, you stop it from being anything but what it says right there, right then. Yeah. Yeah, and, you know, one thing that he didn't, he, okay. There's a few forms of, sorry, sorry, I paged forward instead of the back. There, there's a few forms of, um, well, let's see. He, he kind of assumes that um, the, the secondary uh, root of Masora is this uh, Asur. But real quick, 
I have my strongs list uh, in front of me, my Obery strongs list, and I'm going to find and punch in really quick something um, that I think is also, I think, is going to possibly provide, let's see, a little bit of clarity. Um, yeah. We'll try. I'm in the MUs. Sorry. I need to be in the MSs. Here we go. <laughs> All right. MSs, and where am I going to? Here we go. There's a lot of, of roots, actually, that are just this, this uh, MS root. Uh, there's a lot of them. Uh, let's see. 45, 49. I'm going to punch that in real fast. And I'm hoping that this is the right one. Should be. Well, okay, so masas, that's right, is actually to dissolve or to melt. Um, that's M-S-S. And we also have a couple of others that I want to get to because at one time I... I spent a great deal of time looking at these roots. Um, 4560 also. Let me go forward to that. Uh, to set up, deliver, up or offer, up. Um, now, this is the other one. Now, that's where he went was uh, discipline or direction. But there is the... Um, yeah. Now you have Masure, or it, it'll oftentimes be shown as Maseret with uh, more of a T sound on the end instead of the feminine E. Eh. Um, is a bond, actually. A, a type of bond, they would say like a bond of the covenant, but, but that's kind of hard to say because there are other uh, Mas and Maser roots that imply more like bondage as in chains. Um, I was at, let's see, I went a little bit far forward and there's a few more routes before that that might help too. But what anybody who wants to, to look at that and start fooling around within those routes, they're going to see that a lot of them that at least phonetically fit very close um, have a lot to do with not only as he was saying like discipline but bondage as well um, and, and basically negatives there aren't there aren't really any that they could find that would be even phonetically close to that that really has a positive connotation to it so I just wanted to throw that in real quick that's funny I, because bound yeah. as far as that MSS, that's a sewer right there, but without that MSS pretext, says bound obliged. Mm hmm. Yeah. Um, let's see. Oh, this was the other one. You know what? While we're on it, while we're on it, and now I'm. I'm thinking a little bit better. Let me, I'm going to go and, and do one more source. One of the huge problems with the phonetic play that, that has gone on over the years and how it's been brought down to us is you take, take a word like uh, Masora. Um, the M's probably not played with, but as soon as you get to the S voice. Um, and if you went back to Obery, you could have uh, as its root, as its source, you could have S, you could have Sha, you could have Sa, or you could have Z, one of four different glyphs. Um, and that, that's something that makes all of this very difficult and very confusing. And it's, again, something that I don't think is an accident. Let's see. Yeah. I'm going to punch in. Uh, 
another one real quick here because this is this is actually uh goes a little bit deeper to the heart of these roots and let's see right you get to uh the root sar and it's used as um heavy or sad um the uh the world book of the old testament will will give you definitions such as implacable rebellious um over and over again you're going going to see just about in every way possible um, that you could look into the, the roots of this it being negative not a positive so I don't and the, and the thing is I'm, I'm just not willing to put anything past the the occultists who, who have spent a great great deal of time developing this system uh, the Mazora into what it is today um, I, you know, I've got a feeling that if I had, uh, the time to look into the most recent, uh, so-called standardization that happened with the BHS, <laughs> that, uh, we would fro- probably find names in there that if investigated, if even known of, they would probably be e- even people that were n- not known of that, that you would never have heard their name before or since. But if you could, if you if you could find some, dig some background information up on some of the names involved in that, you would probably find, without exception, occultist after occultist. Um, and as pretty much every authority on uh, codes, ciphers, and occulted language and number systems will tell you, uh, one thing that these Secret societies and occults thrive on is um, codes and ciphers. And it is right now, um, I haven't had the time to really pick apart the way that the Masoretic, in general, the whole system works in regards to the, the actual glyphs themselves and the words. But I am willing to bet um, what little reputation I have that there is a very intelligent occulted system applied in that Mazora, those Nakud, to those words. And I'll I'll give you one reason why I can say that with with at least just a bit of authority is because I have a document that I've been working on little by little for a couple years now. And it's actually a, a document that is, is examining all of the, the biglyph parent root words and attempting to determine the, the most exact translative meaning in English uh, of these. And what I have to do oftentimes is I have to ex- extract these biglyphs f- from larger words. I usually end up doing that while I'm doing studies on other words. Mm-hmm. Now, the last five, the, the last five biglyph roots that I have extracted um, underneath the root itself has been the double comets. Comets is one of the, the symbols. And if you see that once, you go, huh. If you see that twice, you go, hmm. You see that three times in a row, you go, isn't that something? You see it four times and you go, there's no way. Five times. This has been five times now. Um, I'm not saying that those are below every every biglyph root that there is. Because a lot of the, the biglyph roots I've taken from what Strong's actually has listed as, as a simple two character word. However, in a lot of cases that they've listed a simple two-character word, it's not a simple two-character word. And it's actually not represented often as a simple two-character word, which is the real rub (laughs) to that, which is actually why I had to go about extracting the actual biglyph roots myself because you can't even trust them (laughs) 
<laughs> when they give you these the biglyphs because a lot of them um, they're not right either. Like for instance, I'll give you a good example. Okay, ab. It's about probably the first biglyph you'll see. I think it's actually H one, and they translated, of course, as father. Ab. The problem is if you do a search on ab in say uh, esort. You right-click on it. You want to see all the occurrences of Ab in the Old Testament. You might find out of, it's well over a thousand, actually, uh, um, the amount of times that uh, Ab appears is 1,215 times. Out of those, you might find one or maybe two uh, that's actually Ab. And who knows why that is? I don't even know if that's that's a scribal slip. Every other time, you're going to see it as Abi with the E at the end. Yeah. Now, that could it's have something to do with... Slip. Yeah. <laughs> that many know. times. But, yeah, well, I'm... You know, the thing is... Okay, now some, some people could say, well... And, and this is reasonable to say something like this. Well, okay, look, when you have that E or the, the so-called Yad at the end uh, of a word. It oftentimes means of. Um, that's, that's why uh, oftentimes when, when rabbis will take something like Asher, which is uh, presented in the Bible as Asher, uh, not Ashery usually, it's just Asher. It's very, very rare that you might see that, but they'll always refer to it as Ashery. That ich at the end means of. So, so I mean, somebody could reason and say, well, you know, for somebody to be a father, they have to be a father of. Maybe that's why you see the word for brother, ah, with an e at the end very often. Or if you see the word um, like hatsi is, is the word for half. Well, you can't have a half of something unless there's another portion of it. Somebody could reason that out. Maybe, you know, that then that's why. Uh, um, but... You know, I haven't seen that you have that with everything that requires an of. And the point is that there are a, a great deal of of so-called biglyphs that that Strong's lists that don't turn out to be uh, in the text as they appear. It's the same thing with with That's Strong's H three. It also appears as ob, but. But both, or I mean, it's listed as Ab, uh, same as fa Father. But the two times that it appears in, in all of the text, it appears as Be, A, Be, Ba, Ab. It doesn't appear as Ab at all. So, and, and the reason for all of that that I just went into is just to explain that, no, I haven't seen that double commits in every uh, instance of of what's considered a biglyph root, but I'm not yet convinced that all of the instances that Strong's claims are biglyph roots are actually correct. You know, five times mm -hmm. now, five times. That, that that's that is enough for me. Even though I thought it years ago, I thought this is some kind of a code or or a cipher or a code with a cipher in it or something this is how they th this is my thinking this is how they manage to preserve the text for their eyes only while simultaneously hiding it from ours that's um, maybe there's a lot of yeah that's easily seen and easily done it actually happens a lot um there was a time when i took a look at the hermetic and thelemic practices and uh, the language of thelema is so heavily tied with astrology and numerology that um when they sign their letters when they s when they speak different words when they sign their names mm -hmm. they add their own specific astrologic and numerologic uh nick you do you could say yeah and what is language shared experience if you have no experience reading this you would never know that 
Trader Perturabo with a triangle of dots actually mm-hmm. means 777 next to his first initial. Yeah. And so it is it is a practice of characterization, but it surpasses that first initial vulgar understanding of the word and into the spirit of the word. And so yeah. if the if the Crowleyites and the rest of them um had been doing this time immemorial and they mm-hmm. claimed they took it from Egypt. Well, mm-hmm. we have something very like it in your biglyphs. Yeah. And it's easy to decipher, yeah. but only once you have that experience shared. Yeah. Um yeah. 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 It, it, so I think I, it's there. I, you I, know, I don't know what Dialave knew. But obviously, he knew enough, whether he was on the inside, outside, or somewhere in between, he did, did know enough to already tell us that he just thought the general rabbis in the, cine, uh, in, in the uh, synagogues trying to exegete this were wasting their time. <laughs> um, so he may have known a lot more than we think, I suppose. Yeah, because I, I think they're communicating. You know, um, if nothing do, do, else, you know, they're communicating the spirit of something, whereas yeah. uh, without and, that shared right. experience, we're left to only mm-hmm. the vulgar interpretation. Yeah. So uh, I think every time we rabbit trail, we actually get a lot further down the road. <laughs> if that makes more sense. Uh, every time uh, I have to be were s- scripted, it's yeah. It's it's like tying my hands behind my back. If I've got to, if I've got to follow too rigidly the work of um, either an academic or an occultist or both, um, it's rough. It's rough on me. Like <clears throat> I, you know, I read the part where he used French as an example, and um, yeah, I wasn't feeling it. Uh, uh, it <laughs> just. It really left me kind of, uh, kind of empty. I didn't think he proved anything, uh, personally. Um, but I did. You have, uh, did you have any any different thoughts on that? Um, I I don't personally, you know, um, I don't know how much I want to get into, really, uh, the, the the exact uh, vowel points either, other other than maybe. Maybe naming them. I mean, the the information is just about anywhere, um, and he's you know he's just going to spend a, a, just a bit of time explaining that they're they're vowel points and and the, the, you know they're eight basic vowel points and and you have a f- few derivatives besides, but they're essentially making you know vowel sounds. You have the the kmets makes uh, more of an ah sound and, and the zir makes more of an eh and the hirik. Uh, and you know, an uh, I and holum O. Okay, and and the, the thing is, they are relatively basics. It's just the the rules of grammar of Masoretic Hebrew are off the chart. They're nuts. And and part of it is, and I think this goes back to and reinforces the theory that what we're looking at is not a system of standardization whatsoever. If it were, and I, I was explaining this to somebody earlier today, actually, if this were actually a sister system of standardization, any rational thinking person um, would conclude, okay, if they didn't have vowels and they inserted uh, vowels between the consonants as... Uh, as what fit. And if the people out there believe this and, and they believe that this language came from um, the perfect, infallible creator uh, of everything and that he specifically gave, gave this language, um, they would have to, I would think, they would, they would have to con- conclude that there would be a consistency to the types of vocalizations 
that we see occurring with certain consonants that yes. it wouldn't it wouldn't be like what we see when we get a word that let's say it's parsed out in in 10 different forms and, and you know i really think i ought to i re really think i ought to actually show an example of that real quick and, and i can bring something up that that should give us um that should give us a really good idea of what I'm saying because yes. it's ridiculous. Um, here, okay, the first one I came by, I'm just going to punch in the first one, and I'm, I'm hoping that it, it will be a good example so I don't have to spend too much time uh, looking. I'm going to go with uh, um, the, uh, the Obri word, uh, I, and... It's translated in, in, in different ways. Sometimes it's translated as where. Sometimes it's translated as, as in the, the place referred to across the sea. Um, the I am uh, of the yam, um, which is, in my opinion, where the landmass of Asia earned its name. Uh, but to not get too far in, into that. So let's the first appearance in the concordance of this. And it's just two glyphs. It's the ah and the e. The first one is pronounced ah -he. Now the second one is just pronounced e, like a long e. The third one is also e. The fourth e. The fifth e. Now, in that case, you only had two variations of the pronunciation. But if we go to Strong's number 422, then we have ale. And that is an a, an l, and an e. The first is pronounced ala. The second, third, fourth, Allah, the fifth eh, la, and then al la, putting an emphasis as if there were two l's. Next is al le after that, and then another al le. So in that instance, you have four different variations. My point is, I think it's kind of an in insane uh, way of thinking to accept that, that a consistent God, who's not a God of confusion, but of order, if he were to hand down a language like this, that he wanted his, uh, his records kept in for a very long time, well over a millennia, just in the time they were being kept, but covering much more time than that, um, there would be definitely a, a consistency in the voicings. Okay. Um, you know, I'm working with a, as much information as I can get concerning not only our modern Western languages, but Proto-Indo-European and everything that I can squeeze out of, um, we'll call it ancient Hebrew or Paleo-Hebrew, Obri, uh, to come up with just the the names of these glyphs and their, their vocalization. But I'm not claiming um, that it's the end-all, be-all. However, if we want to play devil's advocate or suspend disbelief and believe that that was really the way it was, then each one of these probably would have, like many languages that that even exist to this day have a certain vocalization that either precedes or follows um, the the consonant itself. Let's say, like the the Masoretes call the fifth letter in the glyph set, they, they call it a he. So it obviously has a breath sound that precedes the the vocal or vowelish sound. He. 
Now, if that was the case, and it was actually known as that from time immemorial, then it, it just stands to reason that it would probably always be followed by an E sound or preceded by a breathy H huh sound. It's, it's insane to think that there would be such variation in these vocalizations. No one would remember that. I don't know how you could possibly begin to keep track of that. Most people would be illiterate. The only people who would have a grasp on that would be the priesthood. And it simply wasn't that way. Most people knew how to read, write, and speak throughout the Bible as recorded in the Bible. Okay, that kind of, of inconsistency and what it breeds, we see in the Masoretic and in the priesthoods and in the secret societies, the occults, and the rabbinic writings and doings. We don't see that biblically. So what, whatever the language form was and how they used it uh, in the Bible is not what we're seeing when we just page through a concordance and look at all of the various vocalizations of the same word based on the vowel points that the Masoretes have applied to it, which are, in fact, inconsistent. Now, they could say, well, it's consistent because if there's five entries, um, if all five of them mean something different, then that's the reason behind us applying those different vowel points to it. But again, then they're going to have to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that they do, in, in fact, mean those very different things. And that, again, then we have to go back to this different vocalization for these things. But if you also look and, and you cross-reference the roots in those various words that may have those different meanings, and one that say parsed out, out five different ways, you're not going to find a consistency in those roots if you can even identify them and track them down and cross-reference them. There is no logical consistency to the vocalizations of Masoretic Hebrew. End of story. That, that, that alone should give everyone doubt to its uh, veracity. That's all I can say about it. I agree. I have nothing to add. Um, <laughs> the whole idea being that that these people attempted to specialize to such a degree to make things easier, and yet we find the end result is that it is more difficult. It's simply an obfuscation. When someone comes in, this needs to be as unintelligible to anyone but us as possible. Yeah, and they achieved that. <laughs> Bravo. Yeah, they, they achieved that. It is, uh, it's, it's very difficult. And even speaking to um, native Hebrew speakers, because the, the, the language that they speak officially in um, the occupied territories of Israel is essentially this Masoretic. That's that's what they adopted to be, you know, their their uh, their national language. That's what they teach them in their schools. So speaking to people that even were raised from the youngest ages, being taught that, they will, will tell you that it is a language very much like English, in the sense that the rules don't make any sense. Exactly what I was about to say, too. It is exactly like English. You just have yes. to accept a million caveats as you come by them, and it takes grades K through 12 for you to hopefully have a solid grasp on it. And don't mm -hmm. worry, even if you don't have a solid grasp on it, we have emojis, and now we spell your as you are instead of Y-O-U-R. 
So mm. there are a million shortcuts because you never actually fully grasped your own language. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, make no mistake, uh, even with the generalizations that I will sometimes characterize Jews with, uh, there certainly is a divide, a clear divide that one can witness between um, the, the common Jew on the street, the, the common Jew that goes to public schools in, let's say, public schools in, in the occupied Israel or whatever schools they might have here, whether they be a part of a removed uh, Chabad community or whatnot. There's a difference between them and the rabbis and the people above the rabbis in the sense that those people don't know these things like those at the top of that echelon do. They have their own divide amongst them just as much as they have created a divide between them racially and most other peoples. There, there's still one within them as well. Yes, the, there's a language hierarchy that most aren't privy to. This is a, just like keeps being brought up the language of the law versus the common language yeah here in, here in america and canada and everywhere else mm -hmm. it's um mm -hmm. it's based on codices that no one is actually privy to that no one even knows exist yeah yeah both of them uh as far as i'm concerned they have the same designers um the same architects same practitioners you know, um, those who were responsible for uh, that sort of uh, linguistic dualism in Hebrew are the same architects as those who are responsible for the, the dualism in English between uh, your common English and your legalese. Um, and I think they've been responsible for all of those sorts of um, uh, discoherencies uh, in languages uh, for as long long as you know we know anyways um let's see uh, one so, final thing go ahead. yeah as as for this over specialization and this need for over specialization there is none there's plenty of proof in plenty of other languages that we don't need a separate word or a separate vowel attachment um uh, German, for instance, trinkt. Mm -hmm. That is to drink, drinks, is drinking. And as soon as it's uttered, you you know the difference. Mm -hmm. It's very simple. And mm -hmm. I, I tried to decipher some of this um, Masoretic attachment mm -hmm. this week. And um, I gave up as quickly as I started. <laughs> Mm -hmm. not a surprise most people who see it through there's there's two people that that tend to see masoretic through in general uh, um one is the jewish kids who have to go to their schools um and get taught it okay they they do because they have to um, and the other people that tend to stick through it to the end are seminary and theological students, Bible college students. They have to, to get those credits. You talk to, talk to anyone out there, talk to a pastor sometime about his understanding and love of the Hebrew language and see how passionate he becomes. He might become passionate, but it's not going to be in the way that you might want. Um, they, they, they tend to really not like it and most of them tend to treat it like your let's say your average student out there who's using softwares like, like eSword or um, that one Michael Heiser software I can't remember anyways in, in basically the same ways they forget it as fast as they learned it it's, it's not a mistake it's just a formality yeah it's it's a, a language that, that just seems designed to put people off. 
What a thing to think. Again, I'm going to go back to this common sense thing. What a thing for a language um, handed down by by a perfect, orderly God to be that off-putting, that ugly to the senses and the mind. Um, Again, to me, the two just don't harmonize. Um, now, did, go ahead. Yep. As, as we were talking about this, he goes into the origin of the vowel points. And you're right, mm-hmm. I skipped over the French. I, I understand it as I read it. We yeah. get it. There are, there are many different things you can do in different languages, and they're represented almost identically, whether yeah. in verbiage or in script. Mm-hmm. But when he gets over here to these, uh, to the long vowels and short vowels on page yeah. 81, he yeah. picks these apart. And I just can't stop thinking that if you were to read these without any of the markings, that all you would need is the sentence around it to know the difference. For the most part, that's correct. The Okay, so here's two things. Now, this coming from one of the few people that I'm aware of, and that's me, who has approached this language um, from a very um, rudimentary point and took his learning of it forward without any Masoretic influence at all. Um, once... The biggest obstacle, once you get rid of all of of the vowel points, to your understanding, kind of two. Well, and it actually comes down to one. It it really is is the lexicon. It's the it's the the you know the full dictionary of meanings. And um, that's kind of the one thing that's going to hang you up. You do actually. You'll see something so often, and this is one of the reasons why I tell people, um, you know, don't freak out at me if I say something like, look, anywhere from probably 20 to 30 percent, maybe a touch more of the words that you see in the Bible, they're not translated right. Don't get mad because (laughs) we still have a pretty good form of what it's saying because you have to, everything has to submit to consistent rules of grammar. So you're going to keep seeing certain phrases and words that work together. You are where you get tripped up. And this would be right where you're talking about. This is where the rubber meets the road is um, that you do have a pretty full lexicon of words. Even if you didn't parse them out, you would. And then the second thing is, because they parse them out the way they do, there's so many homonyms, apparent homonyms, based on what the concordances and lexicon say. There's apparent homonyms. And those are oftentimes the things that trip you up the most. They're, they're words that aren't very, very common and um, also ones that may be more common but they're separated into words with very different meanings. I can, mm-hmm. can tell you every word that I have done a word study on so far, that I have focused my attention on, and I have said I'm going to get to the bottom of this. Let's say it's a word that, that's uh, it's listed, I don't care, five times, ten times. Oh, And ooh, I've, I've I... determined myself, yeah, what's that? There's a perfect example. You actually told me about one of these instances um, where you believe that uh, brick and tree were conflated. Do you remember that? Brick and tree. Well, let me think about that for a second. Now, the common word for tree is oats and brick. Well, the thing... It was a statement um, about purifying a brick, turning red brick to white. 
Uh, yeah. Well, what I think what I was saying was um, Laban is the common word that's sometimes translated as white. And it may mean uh-huh. white because there is a tree or a stick or a branch that's called Lebanese. And also the moon is sometimes called Lebanese. And I, I think what I said was that uh, it was it was really, really strange, I thought, um, that there was this wood called Lebanese. And we don't know exactly why it's called that. And there's a region called Lebanon. And they always try to tell us that it's called that because of snow-capped mountains. And Laban is often translated as white. But I said the thing is, there is this wood called Lebanese. It, it simply just has that female eh ending on it. And this whole region could be called that more because of the wood that that it's named after. And it, it in no way has to have anything to do with white um, or snow or anything else. I don't remember what the red part of that was. And I hope I haven't really thrown you. I do remember when I was doing the word study on that. Um, but yeah, there's there's a lot of, of things that are kind of conflated. And uh, I actually had to do a word study on Laban f- for the Bible and Obrey episode where I approached white. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I don't think that there is, I don't think that there is the difference between all the appearances that you're going to see of either Laban or Lebanese with just that feminine eh at the end. Um, I think that there's there's a couple of ways that a word is formed and why it's used in Hebrew. And I was surprised to see that he actually addresses one of those a little bit later. There is either the concrete based on the glyphs and how they interact with one another. There is the abstract that is things or actions that are based on something concrete. And we do that in our language today. We have abstractions that are called that because they remind us or are similar in some way to something concrete. Mm -hmm. And then then there's the onomatopoeia, both the phonetic or the visual onomatopoeia. Now, that's basically the ways that I see words being generated in Obrey. Um. And and so you take Laban, for instance, there is a reason. And I got close to the heart of that with that. There's a reason why all of those different entries that are either Laban or Lebanese um, are what they are. And they all have to do with one another. They're not homonyms. Um. I think I said this, I don't know if I said this in, in these recordings or if I just said it in, in one of the episodes of the Bible with Obrey. Um, homonyms are to grammar uh, as detrimental as diaphones are to a word or, or phonetics, just the phonetics mm-hmm. of a word. You yeah. know, the fact that everybody uh, has come to know the Kaiser as Caesar is very detrimental to our understanding of things. Uh, um, we don't tend to connect things because of those diaphones. They're very, very confusing. Um, I had mentioned to you in a text not long ago, that I, I had asked, does anybody really put together the fact that the supposed country that the, the vast majority of self-identified Jews come from today, it was supposed to be an ancient country called Khazaria, and the people were called Khazars. It's phonetically the exact same thing as Kaiser, which we see in the Bible, a character named Caesar. Are those things connected? Well, I would think they have to do at least a little bit with one another because they're phonetically exactly the same. But if we all believe in uh, homonyms, well, then who knows? And I'm not saying that um, that there aren't similar phonetics between different languages. Because, of course, have, you only have so many sounds you can make. Yes, but only if they have a shared experience or a shared past in a family. Uh, for instance, English, he. 
Well, he is the man. That's that's it. When you when you have a vagary where you point to a man and you say he. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. However, he in Japanese is fire. Mm -hmm. No relation. Phonesis fails you. Yeah, complete. And so, yes, uh, homonyms are dangerous if you don't understand that they they are less applicable and less universal than one would assume. Yes. And that's right. That's right. What I was getting around to. And, uh, I completely agree with that. The, the, uh, the thrust of what I was saying concerning Kazars and Kazaria was that when you find two concepts that are in some way, however, uh, distant they might seem, but in, in this case, I have to believe that they are more closely related than we would be led to believe. And, and yet you have this phonetic similarity. I think it, it, it is at least incumbent upon most people uh, that understand that to give it a lot more attention than, than if you were comparing English to Japanese, to very, very, very different languages that happen mm-hmm. to have a lot of very similar phonetic sounds. Um, so yeah, I see your point to that too. Um, uh, was there, was there more, because I know we did interrupt the, the, the stream of what you were saying concerning the information that he had on those couple pages where he does review the long vowels and the short vowels of, of the, the vowel points. No, he, um, he basically just irons out a few of the points um, mm-hmm. and the purpose being to fix yeah. something, to nail it down. So they took something more ideographic and they went full left brain with it. And mm-hmm. when you nail down to a certainty, you erase the possibility. Mm-hmm. And so um, a lot of this for the reader may be informative, but... As far as the conversation, it's just mapping out the reasons. So Mm -hmm. um, he does say in page 82. um, You know something? Yeah. Go ahead. Well, you know, a thought just occurred to me maybe before we we get off of that entirely. Because part of the the system of the uh, the Masoretic Nikud is the uh, sin or shin dot okay it's it's over the uh the the glyph i call sha and if it is to the right it's going to be uh a sound of a sh and if it's to the left it's going to be the sound of a s like an s there's there's actually a small story told in judges tap chapter 12 where the tribe of uh aprim or ephraim uh goes over the Yarden uh, River, and they, they they end up in a, a large, large battle with um, their brother tribe, um, Minashe or Manasseh. And there's about 40,000 um, Ephraimites killed, and they have to get back to their territory, which is over the Yarden. And it says that the, the Man- Manassites, they took the passages or uh, the uh, Maober, which I believe are bridges, because um, it wouldn't matter if they took the passages if the uh, Yarden was the Jordan and it's got an average depth of five feet anyways. Um, and so when the Ephraimites go, go to pass back over the bridge and the, uh, the, the Manassites are guarding it, they would ask them, what tribe are you from or who are you? And if they said they lied and they said that they were a Manassite or somebody else, anybody but an Ephraimite, they would say, OK, well, pronounce Shibboleth. Say the word Shibboleth. This is in the text. <laughs> it's yeah. it's in the text. They tell you, they say, OK, say the word Shibboleth. And when the Ephraimite said Sibboleth, because they didn't know how by that time. Remember, the book of Judges happens over almost 400 years. 
they had already developed a difference in how they pronounced at least certain words. Mm -hmm. Now, if these vowel points were with the people as long as the language was with the people, why is it in Judges 12 when it says that the Manassites told them pronounce shibboleth, the sha is used. The sha glyph is used. Pronounce shibboleth. But when they say sibboleth, the s glyph is used. Why? Why not? Why, why isn't the sha glyph used? Because if the vowel, if that little point is to the right, it's a sh. If to the left, it's a s. And obviously, that's been with them the whole time. Why would they use a samic instead of just using the inner sin? That's the whole point. The whole point is a different glyph or letter or character or sign, whatever anybody wants to call it, is used there. You see, when you read it in Masoretic Hebrew, all they, all they have to do is spell shibboleth the same way with that so-called shin sin at the beginning of both instances and just change the point from the right to the left. And if you're reading it in Masoretic Hebrew, you'd know that they asked them to say shibboleth and they said sibboleth. Why is the samic used instead of the shin sin? The point is, this wasn't always with them. The point is, the Shin Sin is BS. And if it, <laughs> it was always with them, then they would know. It's just kind of one of those points. Concrete example. It's just kind of one of those points. There's, there's a lot more. The only the biggest problem is mo most of these things I come across when I'm doing studies on other topics. Hopefully, I'll I'll have a, a chance to do a study specifically on that topic for a paper, book, or something else. But um, they they come up all the time. They do. Any anybody who who pays enough attention and studies in, in Hebrew enough. And their salary isn't dependent on them ignoring these things. Yeah. Sees them. They see them. And they know. They know they're all over the place. So, okay. Um, what, was that basically, uh, you think, all we had for for that page? Was that all that, that you had for that that uh, that section anyways on uh, his, his Masoretic voicings? Oh yeah, the rest um, the rest gets into it. He he gets into diphthongs a bit at the end of eighty two, but yeah. um, this is it's it's a lot of either or and a lot of rule making and pointing out, and so um, picking back up on three is uh, is the next bit. But yeah, mm -hmm. as far as this one, um, decent claims. I lost a, I lost quite a bit, quite a bit. I lost quite a bit of time. You turned Australian there for a second. Yeah, go ahead. Quite Sorry. a bit of time. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. <per now. laughs> this book will uh, do that Prissian. to you. Yeah. 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 Prissian um, is one of the bullet points mm -hmm. that cost me so much time in chapter two. And um, are you familiar with Prissian? Uh, I know I read it. I know I read it at least once. Um, Priscianus. I'm sure there was a reason. Go ahead. Says, uh, the name Priscianus Caesariensis, AD 500, commonly known as Priscian, was a Latin grammarian and the author of the Institutes of Grammar, which was the standard textbook for the study of Latin during the Middle Ages. It also provided the raw material for the field of speculative grammar. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> yet another point where looking into 
this book, he cites someone's viewpoints and glosses over, like he'll pick apart so many others, but um, glosses over some of his references as if they're fact. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I noticed that. It's just, yeah. I find myself paying a lot more attention to the bullet points as we go on in this. Um, if no, yeah, because a lot of times they're... Symptoms. Yeah, that a lot of times you're going to get a lot um, more objective information out of the bullet points. Oh. Like, for instance, the, the grammarian that he dismissed in the last chapter, whose idea of attribute and how inseparable it was, at least to the noun, I thought was far more closer to the heart of what this language is expressing than D'Alevay's uh, parts of speech, which is precisely why before I knew how to express it as attribute, I would just say that they were universal words. A thing is what it does, which is its descriptive. That's why one word can be a verb, a noun, or an adjective adverb. Mm -hmm. that, was a, that was a bullet point. And it was it was far more enriching than the text itself. So yeah, that's I tend to pay a lot of attention to the bullet points too. Uh, I'm actually just embarrassed that I forgot the bullet point on Prisian. It how far for that's got to be quite a ways forward though, right? It, it, is it not? Of course, no, you know I spent most um, of my time of laboring two. over his. It's what's that? I'm sorry. It's the end oh, of chapter middle two. of yeah. middle of chapter two. It's, at the middle um, of chapter two. Okay. it's number seven. You you know that long bullet point that took three separate pages to flesh out. Yeah, uh, he mentions the ideas of the ancients, and it's actually a number point seven in that bullet oh, okay. point. There it uh, is, right, right above. Yeah. Yeah. No, I see it. Hephaz has been very well said. By the ancients, the vowels are the soul and the consonants, the body of the words. Seven. Yeah. So he's he's actually quoting Priscian, who is mm -hmm. uh, one of the fathers of our current understanding of Latin, as well as speculative grammar, but quite late to the game. Go figure. <laughs> Go figure. Anybody who's got their fingers deep into Latin, I wouldn't trust. Not as far as I can throw them. And with my hey. bad back... <laughs> Forget about it. Yeah, and um, he uses he actually uses Prisian's idea to say mm -hmm. and it's an if then statement to say then the Hebraic writing and all which generally speaking belong to the same primitive stock became by this slow revolution a kind of body, if not mm -hmm. dead, at least in a state of lethargy where remained only a vague transitory spirit, giving forth only uncertain lights. Mm -hmm. that came directly from Prisian uh, no he used Prisian's oh. initial statement just his initial uh, statement to, okay. to state his own he said if, okay. if Prisian is right then this is true mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah well you know if, if Prisian said that the, uh, the consonants were the body or bones and that the vowels were the soul I would say Say that he's saying something very similar to what I've said for a while about vowels, or as I call them, the singers. Um, I just think that's a little bit closer to the point, calling them that, um, for a number of reasons. Maybe it's just because I'm a musician, but you know, I, I just express that now. Um, it's just kind of, um, I don't want to call it crazy as if you can't have a language, but I don't know how well you're going to express that language without vowels. Uh, you, now, unless you stop breathing while you talk, then maybe. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Nobody speaks Zulu here. But Nobody the, speaks um, Bushman either. I don't... <laughs> yeah. Um, now, I don't know that. this is... Uh, to continue with the statement wherein he uses Prisian, um, it's one of the times where I agree with what he has to say. 
because he he follows all of this up with new ideas change the meaning as new habits change the form. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. yes, new yeah. ideas change the meaning because colloquialisms can't be used. References mm -hmm. can't be used. Things become mm -hmm. like other things down the road. Yep. Um, if this is an excuse for uh, the changes to the language, it is mm -hmm. still a poor excuse. However, it is true that the spirit of a word does change over time. I mean, when you look at the lexicon of English as introduced by our mass media, plenty mm -hmm. of words become distorted, though they don't mm -hmm. change at all. How mm -hmm. long would it be before those words have to endure a physical change because their mm -hmm. meaning has been altered? Mm -hmm. It's yeah. strange. No, no language is ever in stasis. It, none, none that we have recorded, you know, it, I, and I'm, I'm pretty sure, well, you know, mm, I mean, no oriental sorry, languages no, seem, no spoken seem word to be, is in stasis. Yeah. A, a written word may be in stasis, but, uh, good luck with Sanskrit Chinese. Oh, yeah. very, very much. So it, Thanks to tradition, as we spoke of earlier in mm -hmm. prior episodes, thanks to tradition, uh, the written word, the yeah. written character may be preserved, but the no, spoken you, word, just, I, no. Yeah, I believe what. Yeah, I believe what you're saying is is is, is that no language that is being um, substantially used in a in in a contemporaneous way it it, it doesn't stay static. It, it it just inevitably evolves in some ways. Now I don't know if um, I don't know yet if there's a lot to it or not. I do see uh, I do see words that I believe have the the same sort of spirit to them, or the, the same sort of body or core to them expressed in. Uh, slightly variant ways, depending on what prophet you uh, you reference. Now that doesn't mean they're actually they're entirely changed, but there are prophets, and the prophets all, all lived at different times, and some of them at very different times, because we're talking about something that happened, uh, the recording of it happening over over a millennia. So that's a long time. Um, our language has changed. Uh, quite a lot in just a few hundred years, um, you know, and even if the Shibboleth Bridge example, even if there wasn't a hidden hand guiding its change, we still see that there is a natural organic deviation that tends to occur. Um, I think that it's one of the attestations to the veracity of the Bible how little you actually see a change in the language and the words used. Um, but there does seem to be some terminology that is particular to some prophets that you don't see in others. Now, I'm not saying the language is, has changed, but like um, go a hundred years ago and ask someone to define processor and they would give you a very different answer than a 20 something would give you today. Yes. Oh yes. And this, there are tons of examples of this too. Um, the simple meaning of a word or the simple usage of a word changed by a specific circumstance forever. Yes. Yeah. That, that happens. Um, I was going to give an example. I, I, I don't think it would be, it, it would be fair though, because that, then we're getting into Greek, but yeah, I, I'm just, I agree. Uh, you know, I, th what I thought about, I, I just looked real quick at our screen and I see that, that we've got about an hour, 45 minutes of time. 
And our next, um, well, let's see. Yeah, the next thing to uh, to bite into is actually chapter three, effects of the vowel points. And he starts out with the uh, Samaritan text. I actually think that's probably a good cutoff. I know I, I told you in a, a quick text that I'm pretty sure that I bit off way more than I could chew last time when I said that it would probably be good to go to a certain point. And the reason I did that is because I actually was thinking, well, we probably won't need to spend too much time on uh, some of these these Masoretic points or ideas and that we'll, we'll probably just go really quickly to where he starts in on his um, his definitions of the the signs as he calls them or the glyphs and what their their basic elemental meaning is now mm-hmm. i think it's just better to to cut it off here and then just start it back up next week um because for everybody who who hasn't been reading our texts to one another <laughs> we're um we're going to try to actually do every week so that we can chop this up more or kind of fit more in in a session without um without wanting to cram 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 because we're only meeting every couple of weeks so we're really going to try every week and since we're doing that this seems like a good cutoff and then we can just start with three next time yeah that's good um Okay. Especially because if we're going to devote any sig- thought to the statements therein, I mean, there's no need to blow through six chapters if we only really get to talk about three of them. So exactly. it's better this way. Exactly. I agree. Yeah. And, you know, I don't think anybody's going anywhere unless you get quarantined. And in that case, don't let them. Um. <laughs> Yeah, I I tell them right where to stick that quarantine. But <laughs> all right, so uh, next one's going to be really interesting because I I just can't tell you you're, you're everybody's going to see as we go. But it it really did amaze me at my first cursory reading of much of this book how often he says things that I've been s- trying to express in very primitive ways for a long time and we're gonna see that with the definitions that he gives or the impressions that he gives for all of the glyphs and i think we're gonna have a really good time with that so i'm glad we didn't just steamroll over all of this and try to get through too much so all right then we'll wrap it up and we'll be back in a week to continue with this in chapter three Thanks again for joining me, Nathan, and uh, we'll see everybody for installment number five.